Thank you very much. I greet you all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. I know some of you are saying, please, can't we have more of singing? Really? But I, I wish I could also sit down and sing, but I've been asked to talk, so to say something, you have to take it. I don't know. I, I didn't ask. I was asked. I wish you could keep on singing. The vo My voice is not the best voices you want to hear, but what, what can it do? It's Sabbath. All right, thank you. I've, I've greeted you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It's good to be here. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Mfundis. We were together in Nairobi just a few weeks ago. So we drove all the way. We said we have to see him. Otherwise, by the way, uh, we do try and, and see you when you are in our country, in Nairobi, where there's no load shedding, at least where we stay. <laughs> Just to come and pray with you as you go back. Uh, Mutoda was there. Mahamba was there. We stayed. We had lunch together. So when you come around, just call us and let us know. We try and, yeah, and, and see what we can do. Our Kenya shillings go a long way. So we'd appreciate your presence. Thank you, Fundis, for, for the introduction. Uh, beloved, I'm going to read a text. Maybe before I do that, let me uh, uh, issue this warning, really. Um, I may say things you don't want to hear. I'm too old now to really massage your, your feelings, really. But I'll try my best to put it mildly and softly so that you don't get discouraged. Amen? Amen. But if you get uncomfortable, I'm very sorry, you know. Um, I, I don't like it also. I'm a nice person. I want to say nice things. Uh, but uh, we'll try. Pray for me, all right? We're going to read Ephesians 6, verse 4, and uh, it reads as follows. It says here in, my, in this version, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath or to wrath, to anger, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Do not provoke your children. I like that. Don't make your children angry but rather train them up, nurture them, admonish, admonish them. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Don't provoke them to anger. Let's pray together. Our kind and loving Father, we, we feel your presence in this place and we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us to understand your truth and apply it in our lives. In Christ we pray. Amen. And so our focus this morning, and we will talk about this also in the afternoon. Uh, so come in the afternoon, I don't know what time, but we'll be here and we'll talk together. Because uh, you might have some questions. Some of the things I'm going to say are a little bit controversial, but that's the nature of things. So, but in the afternoon, we can have time to share and then ask questions. And I get to learn also from, from your experience. So our, our focus this morning is to try by God's grace to remind you especially as parents, to do your best to put the interest of your children ahead of your interest. Put them first. And as Katie Faust would say in her book, them before us, them before our desires. They are right before our desires. When you choose a wife to marry, you're choosing a mother for your children. So think about your children before you make the choice. Will they love, will they fall in love with this choice? You know, some of our kids look at us and say, hey, this guy is a failure. Look at what she, he chose for us. <laughs> Pointing to the mother, of course. They don't trust you. And these kids have to stay with that person forever. Even when they are married, that person is still there. You read in the Bible that King so-and-so ruled for so many years and his wife was so-and-so. The mother also was there. So please choose well and think about your children. What we are saying, this child-centric approach helps us to, to, to lead balanced life and it, it regulates our choices. You don't have to get married, but once you marry, please follow God's instruction. There is no ought. You don't have to get married. 
But don't try to philosophize once you get married. Once you marry children, take priority. I don't care who you are. Listen, your happiness is the happiness of your children. If you come and say, Pastor, I want to be happy, it's too late. Once you have kids, your happiness is not important. Not in this world. Once you have children, their happiness is important. Because unhappy children makes all of us unhappy. All of us unhappy. Because you want to be happy. Then the rest of us must suffer. So the text is here, do not provoke your children. How do we provoke our children? I know it sounds so easy because we think our provoking is children throwing tantrums. It's deeper than that. We'll, get back, we'll, we'll come back to that. Let, let me just say this. About the Bible as a whole, but also in particular about the book of Ephesians. Can I say this, that God's commandments are for people, are for those who love him. If you love me, keep my commandments. And sometimes people embrace God's commandments without embracing Jesus. It's terrible. You become ugly. And then you talk about the mark of the beast when you are actually the embodiment of the beast in your home. And whenever you say mark of the beast, kids look at you and say, That's the, that must be the beast. <laughs> now, it's good to know about the mark of the beast, but it's also good to embrace the lamb. So even as you talk about the mark of the beast, you will show the characteristics of a lamb in your, in your life and how you relate to each other. So the book of Ephesians is written to those who were saints in Ephesus. So it's, 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 inclu it's inclusive but exclusive in the sense that it's all the saints but not all the citizens. It's for those who have a relationship with Christ. So when Paul says in verse 4, fathers, Parents, do not provoke your children. He's talking to people who are Christians. If you have a problem with that, maybe it is because the book was not addressed to you. So don't take issue with the book. Take issue with yourself. You're reading a letter that's not addressed to you. So when the Bible says in Ephesians, when Ephesians says, wife, submit to your husband, and you have a problem with that, he says, husband, love your wife, and you have a problem with that, maybe it's not addressed to you. You are not a saint. This is, this is difficult. God's imperatives are difficult. They are based on the indicative. The indicative is that you have Christ. It's like God says, you, you, you have Christ. You can do this. You can do what they cannot do. Because you are a Christian. Now listen, I, I'm, let me say this. I don't mean that when you do something wrong, it is because you're not a Christian. You are acting as if you're not a Christian. The Bible says those who have light, you don't put it under the, under the bush, you don't cover it. That's, sometimes we cover the light, but you are still the light. And some of us are light even when we sit there drinking in the, in the beer hall. You are the light that is drinking. And some of us are darkness right there in the church. You have walked into the light, but you are darkness. So, so it's not the physical location, it's your relationship with Christ that makes a difference. And so verse 4 is basically uh, challenging and encouraging us and saying, you, I mean, he sums it nicely in Ephesians 5, 8, he says, you were once darkness, now you are light, walk in the light. There are only two types of summons. One is to encourage you to be light. Two is for you to walk as light. There are only two. The summon is either directed to you to become light or is encouraging you to walk as light. And so in verse 4, one way of walking as light is not to provoke your children because all those who are darkness, they do that for pleasure. They provoke their children because they are darkness, but you are light, you don't do that. I didn't even say you are, you, are, you, are, you are an Adventist. I say you are light. You are an Adventist. Another story. <laughs> so he says, uh, Pastor, I've, I've got four children with four mothers. Um, I can't marry them because they are not Adventist. 
I can't marry any of them because they are not Adventist. Uh, why do you think I should? I say, but you are not an Adventist. You are not an Adventist. Just choose any of those four. You make it look like we're God telling young men, go, marry, go and pregnant them, but don't marry them because they're an Adventist. Make them pregnant, but don't marry them because they're an Adventist. That's, that's ugly. Now imagine your child growing up and, 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 and the child asks, Mama, why, why did my father not marry you? He's an Adventist. And so what do we do? Verse 4, it's a manifestation. It is Paul saying, now, as far as walking in the light, as fathers, please, man, don't provoke your children. So you must. It's an instruction. When you don't do it, you are disobedient. Fathers who provoke their children do not qualify to be preachers, to be elders, to be pastors. You must be disciplined. So we've been called to do the impossible. And Paul says there, I can do all things. And not provoking your children becomes one of those. It looks user-friendly. It looks like it makes sense. It's easy to do, putting children first. It's, it's not easy, beloved. Them before us is not easy. Because by nature, we're very selfish. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The natural mind does not even conjure. It does not even think about this. Can't even imagine it. You see, God does not demand us to do that which is obvious. <laughs> Mothers, breastfeed your child. There's no verse that talks about that. It's a given. But when God tells you to do something, you can be sure it is impossible. You need him to help you do it. Don't get excited. Once he says do it, Lord, I know if you say it, there's a trick. I mean, this thing is, is heavy. I need you to help me. So let me help you try to get to that point. Mothers are, mothers are naturally attached to their children. <laughs> they don't need the Holy Spirit. They are, they are naturally attached to their children. They carry them nine months. That's huge. Nine months. That's serious connection right there. And they breastfeed them. Mothers by nature will die for their children. They will. And so, girls and boys don't really think it's a big thing for the mother to be there. But fathers, hey, fathers. And this text, as much as it talks to all, to, to both parents, mothers and fathers, but specifically it is talking to the fathers. Fathers, please, man. And you, it's like Paul is saying, hey, you thought I've forgotten. And you, you fathers. That was 2,000 years ago. You'd think that things have changed. You see, the connection between the father and the child is amazing. It is deliberate. It is intentional. Mothers can only bring a child at least once in nine months. Even if they pray three times a day, one child, nine months, one child. But a man, a husband, a male... Yeah, I can still say, who? Don't even say that, Pastor. <laughs> In a month, you can have nine. So, what am I trying to say, beloved? Now, who, who needs the Holy Spirit the most? The one who has the potential mass destruction, a weapon of mass destruction. And that's the man. Actually, we men are supposed to be the closest to God because we are the most dangerous without God. We are supposed to be the most spiritual because without God, we are, we are weapons of mass destruction. So you see, when the Bible says, and you fathers, you can be sure that that's not easy. <laughs> Because we're just born to run. We run. We just run. We just keep running. I used to go to movies many, many years ago. When I was eight years, nine years old. There was a film called Run, Man, Run. 
When you see us wearing turkeys, we're ready to run. We run. Leave you with your twins. Leave you with your triplets. Go on. And just go. You know, there's something about us men, and I'm not talking about men, I'm talking about parents, but let me talk about men. There's something about us. You can leave and just leave and be okay somewhere. And your kids are struggling. I don't understand that. I mean, really, I don't understand that. And so, let's say it, beloved, let's say it, that we must celebrate men who are staying at home. We must celebrate men who are present because it's not normal. It's not. I know we take it for granted. Yes, we are angry at our parents. I'm angry at my father for the time I spent without him. We are angry. But, hey, when are we going to celebrate those who are there? They're here. They're here. Everywhere you can see them. They're sitting with their kids. It's huge. Now, I used to say to boyfriends that when you go meet your girlfriend, pray before you say anything. Just say, let's have a prayer. I'm talking about your girlfriend. I'm not even talking about your wife. With your girlfriend, says, let's pray. Let's bow our heads with prayer. In her flat, the two of you at nine in the evening, let's kneel and pray. Lord, please help me. Not to provoke my children who are not yet born. <laughs> of course, of course, ladies laugh at such men. Hey! But I, what else can we do? I mean, just the other day, he comes and I was so ready to help you with this and do this. He says, let's pray. Can you believe in Dombi? Let's pray. Sure. Yes, they laugh at you because you pray. And once in a while, you have to remind them. You know why I pray? Because I'm dangerous. Do you know why I pray? Because I'll kill you. Do you know why I pray? Because I'll make you pregnant and leave. That's why I'm praying. Yeah, keep laughing when they're praying. Let me talk about this wrath. Let me talk about this, this anger, beloved. This is not just your occasional tantrums. When a child, I mean, children are going to get angry now and again. Who doesn't get angry? I'm not talking about this intermittent anger uh, because the child cannot get his ways and is angry, frustrated, discomfort, wants food. But, but this wrath is a settled anger. It is, it is resentment that lasts for a long time. It sometimes surfaces at 35, at 30, at 40, at 50. This is deep. It's silent. You can see him laughing, but inside he's boiling. He's not even aware of that. It's an abiding anger. It's an abiding anger as a result of your upbringing. Not because of what was done to you, but what was not done to you. Not because of what you received, but what you did not receive. You see, there are children who are crying not because the father did something, but the father wasn't there. Now, he's not even sure what he would do if he were there. But for now, he says he wasn't there. I often say, yes, things were bad when we grew up. But for most of us, for some of us, you'd walk in and your father would be there, man. You know? Just a presence. All we are saying right now is just be present. And then we'll take it on, we we'll take it up later on and do something useful with your presence. So when children are provoked to anger, what time do we have? What time do we stop? It's done now. Okay. I made that mistake in the morning. I asked, I said, it's, it's half past, and it was almost quarter past, and I just started. Well, I think I wasted too much time with other things. Let me also confess. So this wrath, which is just this long thing that settles, that stays with you. We, we can agree, beloved, that uh, when children do not get certain needs, and we, I just want to mention those needs within the context. There are many things. I mean, a lot of papers, a lot of literature that has, has, has been written. You've got what they call uh, uh, adverse children experience, childhood experience. There are a lot of those, and we'll probably mention one of, and few of those. 
But I just want to focus on those things that even the government does not worry about. I mean, when the child is abused, governments will intervene. When, when, when these neighbors will do something. But there are certain things that happen to children. And nobody cares. But the child is dying. That's what I want to talk about. Needs that children have and nobody takes seriously. So within the context, it says, in verse, in verse 22, it says, Wives, <laughs> wives, submit to your husband. Wives, I mean, talk about Christian wives. Wives, respect your husbands. And then, and then Christian husbands, love your wives. That's what it says. But there's no government that's going to arrest you for not loving your wife. There's no, there's no government that's going to arrest you for not respecting your husband. But the Bible says, do it. Nobody cares if you don't do it. But the child needs it. I'm going to show you just now. Marriage is for children. We marry because of children. When we protect marriage, we're protecting children. You see, when the Bible talks about children, listen carefully, beloved. When the Bible talks about children, it's always within the context of marriage. Sex is in marriage. The main primary reason, objective for sex, is to have a child. If you don't have a child, it's, it's unfortunate. But the main reason why the sex, that is why when you get older, when you don't need children, it also disappears. There's no child who's here and without. I mean, we have to, our kids need to know that. You don't play with something that can bring a child. Don't play, it's dangerous. This thing will bring a child. So he says, children, obey your parents. And you want to know who are the parents? And I can tell you in the context, the parents are the ones, the parent, my parent is the father who loves my mother and the mother who respects my father. That's my parent. Those are my parents. There are many mothers, there are many fathers, but the one who loves my mother and respects my father, that's, those are my parents. Children, obey your parents. <laughs> who are your parents? My love today, 278, this one Ellen Dwight says, the best way to educate children, to obey their father and their mother. How do you educate your children to keep the fifth commandment? Is to give them the opportunity of seeing the father. Give them the opportunity of seeing the father offering kindly attentions to the mother. Give them the opportunity of seeing the father offering kindly attentions to the mother and the mother rendering respect and reverence to the father. This is not something you do privately. Your kids must know that this man loves this woman and this woman <laughs> respects this man. And the, here he says, it is by beholding that love that children, in, that love in their parents, that children uh, are led to obey the fifth commandment. So you know why children are disobedient and are rebels? It is because we have struggled. We have not been able to, to demonstrate to love each other. But it, it, it doesn't, you don't see the cause. You don't see how, how I mean, how's the, what's the cause? How is this linked? So when the father loves the mother and the mother respects the father, the children <laughs> say we must obey what God said about these people. We will obey them. So when you say let's sleep at nine, we will sleep at nine. When you say let's not go there, we will not go there. You know why? Because you love my mother and my mother is... Does it make sense, yeah? <laughs> just that, just that, beloved. Just that environment. It says these must be obeyed. I will obey you. I will obey God. We bring rebels when we fail to love those who are married to. They go, they go about harming everyone and everything. Because hurt people hurt people. I think I mentioned Carrie Faust. She, and I agree with her. She says, what children need is a loving mother 
and the loving father. Wherever possible, a biological father <laughs> and a biological mother. You know, children are naughty. Children want that guy who is responsible for his existence. I want that guy. I want him to love me. Not, not uncle. Uncle is fine. Uncle can support me. I want that one. You brought me here. Don't run away. Stay with me. Children want their mother. And we, we may not fully understand, beloved, but it's true. You can do all you can. I've seen it. You can do the best. And some of you have done the best in blended families, doing the best you can. And the child knows that if I were with my mother or with my father, I would never receive this. But deep down in their hearts, they long for their mother. They long for their father. You can't do away with that. You can give them everything, but you can't give them their identity. Even when the father sleeps in a shibin, this boy will leave this comfortable home and walk and say, I'm looking for my father. They said, but your father has everything. He has yes, but I'm looking for my father. It's here. It's here. Not my aunt, not my uncle, not my grand, my father. And then you take a decision to deny this boy and this girl of his father, you will answer before God. And some have said it. When they are angry, especially women, to these useless boys, you will never see this child again. Never. That's witchcraft. You're killing that child. And we'll talk about this in the afternoon. One of the things you do in a, in a, in a blended family, you encourage your child to connect with his father. With his, encourage, say, have you, have you called your mother? Have you called your father? I'm not competing. I can never be your biological father. I can do everything, but I'm not your biological father. And accept it. We mentioned these Hollywood stars who come to our countries here, Africa, and say, take these kids, and they take them to America. You think kids want that? You think kids want jacuzzi? You think kids need jacuzzi? They need their parents. And some of us think we're doing it for the kids when you're doing it for yourself. You want a teddy bear that's breathing. Children need their fathers. They need their mothers as much as possible. They are biological mothers. I know some of, some of our fathers die and others can't reconcile and they can do their best. And when you come in and to occupy that space, help to heal the wound. Help to heal the wound. When the boy says, he said, listen, he's your father. Don't also get Ed. Yeah, he's useless. Like no, he's your father. He's your mother. She's your mother. So kids need fathers. They need their mothers. They need stability. They need a marriage that works. They need a functional marriage. Kids are happy when you are happy. <laughs> They want marriage. Now we had a marriage, whatever, just a few days ago. And I was saying to these guys, you have invested so much, you have invested so much money in this thing. You're doing it for your children. When they call, says, hey, we are here for you, for your sake. We're doing this for you. When we come back, you will see wonders. And there were some beautiful testimonies saying, one of the children says, what, what happened? Why is daddy like this? Daddy's in love with mama. You know, daddy's in love with mama. There's love at home. You strengthen the marriage, kids become functional. I promise you, beloved. All right. So if your child is walking on the passage, whatever, and then she hears, I shouldn't be saying this, but I have to say it. I'll probably hate myself for saying it. All right. So when the children pass the door and then, then they hear mama crying, oh, please stop doing You're hurting me. Kill me, rather kill me. Now the kid listens to that. That child is finished. Finished. He goes to school. He knows when I come back, I'll see a coffin. My mother is gone. Killed by that monster. He's gone. She will never perform in school. Never. He sits there. He's lost. And you see him getting into drugs and all kinds of things. There's a pain that he's trying to silence. 
But what happens when that same child passes the, the bedroom and he hears the mother says, Ah, ah, man, daddy. Hi, daddy, man. Stop this thing. Now, I want you to picture that child outside. He's only hearing outside. You can look at the face. That face is smiling. <laughs> These guys are not going anywhere. That boy goes to school. He writes his exams. He, he runs. He runs in the race. He's number one. He's meds everywhere. He comes to mama. Dad, he knows they are there. Because he was there and he overheard them speak nicely to each other. It's amazing. It's amazing. Eh? It's mysterious. Just the two of you loving each other. The kid looks at this and sometimes they pretend as if they are shy. They love it. They love it. Don't close the door and do it. Don't close the door. Open it so they can see that you are not going anywhere. <laughs> but can I, can I tell you something? I must say this. In a blended family, <laughs> it's the opposite. You know, when, when your child as a father or when your child as a mother sees both of you so much in love, he sits there and says, I wish this was my mother. Did, did you hear what I just thought? So that which is nice to the family is not nice to the child. I'm not saying stop doing it, but don't rub it in. Be mindful of the fact this kid is not enjoying this. He actually gets very angry. He can literally get out of the house and go do something wrong. He's very angry because he says, this should have been my mother. I know you're going to say they are naughty. Okay, go ahead. Parents have the right to their children. When they leave the hospital, they want to live with their children, not with any child. And their children have got the right also to be taken by their parents, not by any other parent. No, children just need love. No. Yes. They need love. Yes. Give them. But they need their fathers. They need their mothers. The same people who brought them into being must be there for their growth. We provoke them to wrath when we bring them to earth and then be absent from their upbringing. When their upbringing is left to one person, we deny them the right to, to their parents and mother and father. Especially when we begin to celebrate that. Yes, they may experience and appreciate your love. That's good. But they need to know who they are. I'm talking about kids who don't know who their father is. By the way, I even say to, to mothers, even when the father is gone or dead or left, say nice things about the father, man. I was talking to a friend of mine, the father just disappeared and the boy is growing, he's growing and he's never seen the father. Once in a while he calls but he never comes to see them. Something wrong with that man. Alright, so, but talk to the mother, talk, talk, to the, I don't know what happened with the father but he was such a loving man, you know. That's why you married him, don't make him a monster. You didn't marry a monster, he became a monster along the way. Don't say I knew even from the day I married him that this one is a monster. Because your kids will say, so you brought a monster into our lives. So he was such a nice guy. He loved Kaiser Chiefs. Which one is the right one now? I don't know. But he loved this club, you know. And the kid, the kid just wants to love that club as well. Because he says, my father also loved Kaiser But he has not seen the father. Even when they are dead, even their parents, you know, your father used to like wearing black suit. You will see that child, that child going for a black suit as well. I'm like my father. They want their identity. Am I, am I right in, so far? So we need kids, need their mother, they need their father. <laughs> they need their father. I mean, they don't need two women in the home or two men. Is that, is that okay? Two men will not make up on the loss of a father. See, the father comes with something that the mother does not come with. Have you seen fathers when they play with kids? They throw them up in the air. The child grows to be strong. Mothers, oh, baby. You can imagine if both people are doing that to you, you're finished. 
And so, I mean, if this is true, beloved, then you can say same-sex union is not the ideal. Yes, the, hey, you have a right to marry whoever you want to marry, but you have no right to bring a child. Because if you do so and you provoke that child, you will answer to God. Answer for your own sins, man, not for other people. I want, I want a child, but I don't want a husband. Get out of here. What does the child want? Why are you doing this now? I mean, I understand you made a mistake and things happened, but you can't sit down and say, one of my, one of my goals is to have a child, but not a father for the child. No, man. Uh -uh. How can you plan to provoke your child just from the word go? I want to bring up an angry child. Divorce is terrible. God hates it. Creates all kinds of challenges. But he also hates toxic marriages. And also, some of you, yes, tell him, tell her, tell her, Pastor. Well, she wants to go. She wants to divorce. Tell her that God hates divorce. Yes, yes. He also hates your shenanigans. He hates them. He hates toxic marriage. He hates it. Because of what it does to the children. What must I do, Pastor? Ask God. You know, no, this, 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 this. <laughs> I think we made a mistake by marrying each other. So we're thinking now we should separate. So I say, so, so, so I say, so you're making the second mistake now. So, <laughs> so, so the, the first mistake you made it without consulting God. Now you are separating without consulting God. Go to God and say, hey, what should we do? And he will say to you, whatever you do, don't provoke that child. I, I mean, guys, there comes a time where we must part the ways. We must part ways. But let's do that such a way that it doesn't affect the child. Let's find a way. You know what they say even about divorce? They say even when you divorce, agree that we're not going to stay very far apart for the sake of our children. You're not going to Australia here. No, no Australia. Let's stay here. Them before us. Them before us. And so, 90,000 pregnancies between April 2021 and April 2022. What's happening here? Girls between ages 10 and 19 falling pregnant. I can't imagine that. 10 years. There's a 10-year-old here. Can I see a 10-year-old? Oh, no, no, please don't stand. I'm going to, I'm going to collapse. But a 10-year-old. Now, and the text says, fathers, don't provoke. <laughs> Where's the father to this 10-year-old, to this pregnancy? Where's the mother? You can't call the 10-year-old a mother. A conduit, yes, but not a mother. So there's a mother who's also struggling. He has her own struggles. There's a child who's a mother. Now, what's happening to this child? The mother is a, is a child. The father in his childishness is gone. What's happening? What are we bringing here? What, what is this? All right, there's a lot that is said and uh, trying to find ways. I think they, they're doing the best they can. Um, everybody blames the children. Everybody blames the girl. They're stigmatized, ostracized, marginalized. But what have we done? I think this guy, the NGO, Songololo, Solomon's, is trying. So his parents need to be educated on how to talk to their children about sexual reproductive health. He is assuming that they are parents. <laughs> so, so you're going to talk, you're going to, talk to the 10-year-old on how to raise this child. Problem is that we get into a situation where those who are supposed to be taught are not there. The highest rate of fatherlessness in the world is in South Africa. 62% starts SA of children under the age, under 18. You see pregnancies 10 and 19, children under 18, no father. So, so you think because there's no father, they can't provoke them. The absence is provoking itself, just the absence. 
You not being there, you are provoking your children to not being there. Now, listen, guys. Uh, our, our mothers have done a wonderful work. I mean, I salute the mothers. Oh, beloved, these women are powerful. You know, when God created a woman, he just outdid himself. He can't even believe now. When he looks at this, yeah, I, I can't believe I created. Women are powerful. You know, women would literally be hungry and feed the whole family and get fed by you eating. They're just amazing. This creature, I don't know where they come from. Amazing. And some of them here have brought us up. Well, what we are because of those women. They've done a wonderful job. They are powerful. They are good. But you know what? Even though we come from those powerful women, deep down in your heart you say, when I get married, I'll make sure my child has a mother and a father. You say so. Even though you're coming from them, you say, I will make sure. Because there's something in you that says, yes, a powerful mother. Imagine if I had also a powerful father. <laughs> if, if I'm like this without my father, my mother only, I'm like this, <laughs> whatever it is. But <laughs> I'm like this without my mother. How much more if my father was also there? That's the thing. The world does not know where I, what I would have been if my father was there. Look at what my mother alone has done. If my father was there, maybe we would not be having this corruption in South Africa. So we know from, 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 from literature, from research, that children without fathers are more likely to be aggressive, depressed, low self-esteem, do poorly in schools, be in prison, die by suicide, likely to use drugs. Divorced fathers are not there when they're supposed to be there. Divorced fathers are not able to take care of their little children. Children from divorced families receive less emotional support from their fathers than children from intact families. We know it. Now, here's a point that's even more painful. The death of a parent inflicts less psychological pain and damage on a child than divorce. Divorce is worse because nobody grieves with divorce. Your mother gets divorced, your parents divorce, and that's it. Your uncle say nothing. They just come and they greet you. Nobody says anything. If you are lucky, your parents will call and say, oh, by the way, this is my last night here. I'm leaving. If you are lucky. But otherwise, they don't say anything. I know from experience that one day I woke up and the father was supposed to be, my father was not there. And so, mommy, when is daddy coming back? He's not coming back, that one. Bru, 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 bru. That's how you get to eat. But when your father dies, everybody will come and say, Oh, just yes. At least there's something happening here. next time. But when, when there's a divorce, nothing. There's no prayer. You grieve alone. You can't even say it and say, Mommy, I miss daddy. Because your mama may not like that. So you keep it inside. I'm fine, mommy. I'm fine. I'm fine. You are dying inside. I'm fine. Because you are supposed to be fine. And the anger bottles inside. Them before us, beloved. So, I'm not just saying no divorce, but we also, in, in, these toxic, I mentioned these toxic marriages are terrible. <laughs> this is Tim LaHaye. He has written a lot on marriage. He's read on the book, Understanding Temperament, Men's Temperament. Listen to what he says. He says, female-dominated families have created husbands who are irresponsible and wives who are frustrated and children who are abnormal. I was in this family. Oh, I need to stop. I was in this family. So, so the mother says, so we're talking, we're talking. <laughs> These are old couple, old, old, like married for 60 years. Like, <laughs> so, I'm not laughing really. So the, 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 the father says, the, we're talking and then the mother says, and then the father, <clears throat> what am I saying here? So, and the father says, let me explain Fundis. And the mother says, who, Fundis, who's our pet again, Ogulo? 
don't say that. You know, I was just discouraged. Ah, mama, mama, don't say that. And then I said, Teta, teta, I'm cool. And Nyan Wapeta, yes, seriously. Really, just lived up to the expectation. There's nothing that's going to come out of this one for this. Nothing. And then he said, okay, if you say so, I'll keep quiet. He said, what, what, what did I tell you? <laughs> what did I tell you? I said, hey, man, uh -uh, no, no. This young man says, one thing I like about my mother, I know my father is not the best father in the world. I know he's not very, very, very intelligent. But my mother has protected my father. You know, when my mother speaks about my father, everyone respects my father because of my mother. Hey, how high is your IQ if you married a guy with a low IQ? Huh? And husbands who are not the heads, who are not responsible to anyone, causing havoc in the family. I'm the man here. The moment you say that, then there's trouble. I'm the man here. We're supposed to know that. We're supposed to know that. You call all the children. Hey, sit down. Who's the father here? Who's the father here? And the kids are saying, hey, who's the father? They're asking each other. <laughs> and then they say, let's Google. Let's Google. Let's Google. <laughs> they don't know. It's like, this is heavy. It's like, me, daddy. Me, me, me. And the father, the father. They, uh, 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 me. they don't know. That's why you're asking them. Behave like a father. They will know who the father is. <laughs> Beloved, we talk about those wonderful marriages and I can see them right here. Those beautiful marriages. You know what they say? They say just, just, just by having a relationship with your child, you are already protecting that child from causing pregnancy and be pregnant. Of course, we're talking about statistics here. You know? So I thought it has been shown that the majority of children who are close to their parents, they tend to choose purity. Hey, let's make our homes heaven, man. Even if these boys don't believe in our God, let them say, you know what? I don't believe this thing about heaven, buddy. Hey, if it looks like what we have here at home, I'm going there. Let them, let them say there must be heaven. If this man who leaves this home believes in heaven, I will, let, let me close, let me close, beloved. And so, and God says to Abraham, take this son of yours and go put him on the altar. And kill him. Slaughter him. Not, okay, no, not slaughter him, but kill him. Now, <laughs> sure. It looks very ugly now. <laughs> no, no, not, not, not do that, but uh, whatever. All right, so. The Bible can be rough at times, you know? Sure. All right. David carrying the head. Yo, all right. So, and so Abraham takes the child. He's old. He, they build up the altar. The boy is assisting the father to build the altar so that he can lie on the altar. Then he climbs, says, on the altar. Helen White says, and he asks, says, let me assist you to tie me. What's wrong with this boy? This boy is obeying his father. <laughs> Why is he obeying his father? Because his father loves his mother. <laughs> I trust him. I trust you. I mean, some of us don't come home once in a while. The next thing you want to put your child on an altar, you say, God said I must put it on an altar. He says, what? <laughs> God speaking to you. He will put you on the altar. He says, no. Daddy, you didn't hear. I think you should go to the altar. <laughs> Beloved, here's the thing here. Our homes can be heaven. I promise you, I've been to such homes. I've seen such homes. With my eyes. I said, these kids don't know how blessed they are. You may not have everything. You may not have the latest car. The furniture may not be the best. But I've seen fathers who love their children. I was in such a home. Some men many years ago in Malawi. I walked in, it was poor poverty was written everywhere. It was during lunch. I said, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. We, we're good, we're good. Yeah, this is the, the, the shower with the curtain hanging. This is, it's terrible. Pastor's house, terrible. No, let's, let's not go there. And so, the father, oh, you should have seen that. 
So the father has the child, a seven-year-old of six, I can't remember, sitting on the lap of the father. He eats, he feeds the child. He, I said, this is heaven. This is heaven. I'm running the following day. I see the father cycling. There's a child in front. There's a child behind. They're holding the father like this. You can never efface that picture. Our father cycling to work. Some of you drive big cars. And the child is in that corner in that car. We have to phone the child. He's so far away. <laughs> he's not even looking. He's just playing with his thing. When he's, hey, your school is here. Okay, bye bye, dad. He's looking at me. Bye bye, dad. Doesn't care. Of, of course, I'm not saying we shouldn't have cars. But here's the point, beloved. It's, it's, not, it's not the riches. Heaven can be heaven in that environment. I'm not saying that environment is okay. It mustn't be improved. But, but heaven, heaven is not just what you have. It's the atmosphere. And we can't have that for our kids. We can't do that for our kids. And say, I'll, I'll die doing this. I'll die. If it's hard, wake up in the morning when everybody's sleeping and go close the bathroom, go to the toilet, go to the study and say, Lord, help me to stay here. You know, you know that song in the Adventist home? Adventist hymn. Prone to leave the God I love. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Take my heart or seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I can feel, Lord. There's so much that is attracting me. I want to leave. And say, take my heart, Lord, seal it. I'm not going anywhere. And you work your office says, honey, I'm not going anywhere. He says, but who said he's going in somewhere? I said, no, I'm just telling you. <laughs> in case you don't understand that. And, and I'm saying, beloved, let's thank these fathers. But they're here. Let's thank them. and say, daddy, thank you for being here. Others have left. You know what? Kids are actually having friends whose fathers are not there. And now they, are, they have to answer, why is your father at home? He says, oh, his father stays with his sons, his father. His father is at home. They laugh at him. Say, you have a father. Phew, he has a father. And then kids take that for granted. It, it, it creates so much difference, beloved, to know that I'm going home. Even though my father is not, I know he's there. He's going to call me and says, I'm in Zambia, I'm in so-and-so, I'm in this place. I'm coming home on Wednesday. What should I bring you? Do what I used to do. I'll come from the States once in a while, and I'll bring a toy for my two boys, and I'll buy it here in Kempton Park. <clears throat> <laughs> Who's going to buy a toy for dollars when it's the same toy? So I'll buy, I'll buy the toy, put it in the, in the, in the packet written USA. <laughs> USA. Put the thing there. I take it to my boy, says, he says, from America. <laughs> they tell their friends, oh, our father was in America. Look at what he brought. From America. I says, go ahead. I'm America. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's the heart, beloved. It's the heart. I mean, if I had money, I will really got it from America. But at least it's, let's, let's do it, guys. We can do it. You know why we can do it? Because we are light. We just have to walk in the light. We're no longer darkness. And we are not darkness. In a, we're not darkness. We are light. Let the world know that these Adventist men, these men who go to that church, man, there's something about those men. There's something about those men. I don't know, but there's something about those men. Let us not be a, a mockery to Adventism. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Lord, help us to stand for you. Listen, let's close. Here's the, here's the thing. And some of us have made mistakes. I mean, we grew up in darkness and we do all kinds of things. And now I've got two kids. They've got three kids there. And we're doing the best we can. It's tough. The mothers are angry. You can understand. <laughs> Get out of here. You can understand. Where are you coming from? No, I'm coming from church and we've been encouraged to connect with our kids. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's tough. But please, Lord, help us. Forgive us. And we can tell our kids, you know what I used to do? It was bad. Never do it. Let's stop glorifying our past. He asked me like during my time. Ha, 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 ha. What is that nonsense? Okay, nonsense is not supposed to be said. I, didn't, I wasn't behind the pulpit. I was in front. But <laughs> we, 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 we need to confess. We need to ask God to help us. We need to ask God to forgive us. 
And, and I want to say to children here, yeah, some of us are children still ha having that pain and you are actually prone to do what your father did. Let it stop with you, man. Let's start something new, man. Just say, you know what? My kids will have me. They won't have what I had from my father. By God's grace. We have no excuse. God is your father. He says, I'll never leave you. Connect with him. It makes a big difference. It does. God heals your wounds and you become a father. Even your father will say, you know what? Go in. I mean, let, let your father even be surprised to see what God has done, what God has done. Let your friends be surprised to see what God has done. We need you guys. We need you. If there's going to be a change in this world, we need those fathers to check in. Raise their hand. I'm here. I'll make a difference. Let me see those fathers who say, even if you're, you don't have children now, so I'm, even if they're old, they still need you, by the way. They need you. Those fathers say, I'm here, Lord. I'm here. I'm here. You can count on me. And I see them. There they are. God help you. And those mothers who say, Lord, please, thank you for these fathers who have committed themselves. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Let's pray for one another. Let's stand up as we commit ourselves to God. Our kind and loving Father, we, we want to confess, Lord, that it has not been very easy for us. Yes, we may have stories how life was tough and the blunders we made. It's done, dear Father, but we ask you through your grace, reach out to those children we can't even see at this moment, Lord, for whatever reason. Forgive us, Lord. You are the creator. There's no situation too hard for you. Even when we think there's nothing that can happen, you can still do wonders. Help us to do the best we can and let that best that we have done be perfumed by your righteousness that it can be acceptable and, be, and even be more effective. And for those of us who carry this wound, let's use that wound as it has healed now to make sure that it's not going to happen, it ends with me. So that we can, we can create homes that we never had to bring honor and glory to your name. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. God bless you.